So my talk has a rather cryptic title. Uh, I will try to unpack this for you. Um, before I do that, I'll mention that uh, most of what my lab does is research on uh, AR and VR, in particular on user interfaces for AR and VR. These are just a couple of images of some of the stuff that we've worked on, um, none of which over here I'm actually be talking about today. So what am I talking about? Um, I'm showing you over here images of uh, current commodity AR uh, displays. Um, so you're seeing on the left and right, uh, probably well-recognized uh, two optical see-through head-worn displays um, from uh, Leap, um, uh, Magic Leap, and from uh, Microsoft, the uh, upcoming uh, HoloLens 2, and then two video see-through displays, uh, things ranging in price from around 1,000 and change for the HTC Vive Pro i at the bottom, um, up through the left and right, and a couple of thousand dollar range, and in fact over ten thousand dollars for the Vario XR1 uh, at the top. Uh, so, this is what we have right now, and to start uh, explaining the title of my talk, um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the notion of things getting bigger. Now, I'm not referring to the big bulky things we currently have to put on our heads. I'm referring instead to the need to increase the size of the field of view that these various devices have. <clears throat> now, to give you a touchstone for this, if you look at what we can do as people, um, if you look straight ahead, don't turn your neck, don't move your body, keep your eyes looking straight ahead, no fair looking left or right, up or down, okay? Um, if you have a healthy vision, especially if you're young, you have roughly around a 190 degree horizontal field of view. Okay? Um, now, that doesn't mean you can read something over here, but it means that if I'm looking straight ahead, and especially if there's something moving in the periphery, I can actually see it up to around 190 degrees. Varies depending upon the shape of your head um, and the health of your eyesight. Vertically, you get around 125 degrees. Again, both eyes looking straight ahead, no fear moving left and right, up and down. That will actually increase those numbers. And in fact, in the center, you get around 120 degrees worth of stereo overlap. So the image that I'm showing up on the screen over here, um, the black parts are brow and cheek. Um, the white part is seen by both eyes, roughly around 120 degrees horizontal. Uh, the gray part is seen by only a single eye, um, cut off, in fact, uh, on your left for your right eye and your right for your left eye by Mr. Nose in the center of your face. Okay? So that's a pretty wide field of view, and yet if you look at what's out right now, the numbers I'm showing you over here don't even approximate what you can get for regular VR displays of the commodity normal people would buy them sort right now. Okay? So we really need to go and increase that field of view. Now, people often talk about things like presence and immersion and how if you have a wider field of view, you're going to have a better experience in a kind of really emotional way. That's very true, actually. But there are some applications in which that bigger field of view, not necessarily wider, is really important uh, for other reasons. So let me give you an example of one of those. Um, this is work by uh, Yuhan Chao uh, at uh, Cornell Tech. Um, on AR visualizations for people who have low vision, people who aren't blind, uh, they have some vision, uh, and they really don't want to use a cane, especially when they're walking up and down stairs, and yet this is difficult for them. What you're seeing on the left is work in which there's a stationary projector, this is kind of the gold standard, projecting on the floor, perfect registration, carefully arranged, uh, to highlight the edges of the stairs. Now on the right, you're seeing a visualization that was designed for the original version of HoloLens, which has a relatively small field of view. And you'll notice that it's kind of cut off at the bottom over here, because that's as far down as the display actually goes. And in this case, this visualization is designed to sort of raise up with these little vertical lines some representation of the fact that the stairs are going down over here. It changes as you're walking. But the important point there is that a person wearing an AR display, it would be great if that person could see, essentially, you know, highlighted, uh, emphasize the stairs in front of them going up or down. And with a display like that, you can't. And it's not for lack of the width of the field of view, it's a lack of the height of the field of view. And width is really the, the metric that people like to use a lot. They want wider fields of view, 
And there are many applications in which width isn't the issue. It's really the height of the field of view. And I get that if I'm walking down the street, looking straight ahead, I can still have a sense of what's happening down here beneath me. And if that stuff were being presented only in AR or only in VR, I wouldn't be able to see it because the field of view would cut off. So that's very, very important. Okay, we go from big, bigger to faster. So what do I mean by faster? I'm referring over here to latency. We want to not just increase field of view, we want to decrease latency. Now latency, recall, is essentially the time between some stimulus, a cause, and the response or effect that results from it. You can think of sensing being done, computation based on the sensing, and then some kind of display is given to you that you can see or hear or otherwise experience. People often talk about motion to photons, where the motion is the motion of your head as you move around and want to have the view be consistent with how your head is moving, your hands, or even things in the world for that matter. And so it's really important that we get that latency down. Now, back in the old days, before VR, people used to say things like, 100 millisecond response time, I do something at the keyboard, a tenth of a second later I get a response, that's reasonable, as long as it's that or below, that's fine. Now, we all know that that number sounds really, really high, despite the fact that, sadly, a number of the video see-through systems on the market right now actually have more than 100 milliseconds worth of latency. But people feel very smug and proud if they get down to, let's say, 20 or 30 or maybe even 10, right? Now, it turns out, actually, people are much, much more sensitive to latency than you might otherwise think. There's some beautiful work done at the University of Toronto by Dan Wigdor's group um, in which he basically has developed, and this is not VR, a one millisecond latency 2D touchscreen. You can see a projector up over there. There's a very high speed projector made with a Texas Instrument DLP uh, kit, which can churn out many, many thousands of frames per second, especially if you're willing to go down to only one bit. He's got a very uh, sensitive uh, with very low latency uh, touchpad down over here. And the idea is the projector projects down, the touchpad senses, and this thing actually works at under one millisecond worth of latency. So let's actually see a picture of this. And so what you're going to see over here when I start the video playing is a person just moving around their finger, which is supposed to be moving a little uh, sort of square of light. And you'll see as it starts going over here, this just looks like kind of bad latency on maybe an older uh, uh, tablet of some sort. Now with 50 milliseconds, this is looking more and more like what you might be getting um, with a current uh, system. Here's 10 milliseconds. You can still see that that square is not moving consistently with the finger, right? And now we go down in a little while to one millisecond, and that should really look like he's moving a little piece of paper with his finger over there. It's one millisecond of latency in this work that Albert Eng did um, in Daniel's group. So one really interesting thing is they not only made that system, but they did a number of studies with it, and they did a study with a small number of participants, 10 participants. And in the 10 participants, they tried to see where was the point at which you got the just noticeable difference of someone being able to reliably say 75% of the time when comparing two different latencies, this one is faster or this one is slower, and be right three quarters of the time. And it turns out that on the average of just 10 people, it was around six milliseconds of being able to notice it. But even more fascinating with just 10 not particularly not really carefully chosen, they're kind of just people from the community, just 10 of them, there was one person who reliably was getting down to 2.4 milliseconds. And if you think about this just being a group of 10 people who are willing to participate in the study, think about people that you know who might have really fast reflexes, and then unless you know people who are Olympic athletes or world-class musicians, they probably are going to pale before those people who just are able to move in ways that, that regular people can't move. So I would suspect that if you actually did a study like this with people who were known for having really good reflexes, you would see much lower, actually, than 2.4 for being able to notice stuff. Okay, last thing I'm going to mention. A um, little bit different from the first two. Uh, what do I mean by out of hand? And by that I mean the notion that 
while we often talk about being able to go and do bare hand tracking and do it better than we can right now, there are many applications in which we don't want to do hand tracking because our hands are busy doing other stuff instead. So no controllers, no hands. We want to simply be able to interact without having our hands be made to do something that they're not currently doing. I'll give you an example uh, of this. This is a, uh, a system that was developed in my lab, currently being used experimentally by physicians uh, at Columbia. Um, it is a hands-free AR system being used in what are called vascular interventions, which a physician is going to thread a catheter and wire through your vasculature, uh, starting at one place and then going to another place in your body in which they're going to be working. Um, and what you're seeing in this image over here is um, a uh, person wearing a hollow lens, which is what the system runs on. On the left, you're seeing a patient-specific model of a body part. This is what happens to be a heart. And in this system, it's designed for use by a physician who is wearing it during a procedure. And the idea is normally they'd be looking up at this big monitor that you can actually, uh, I think, see up uh, above over here. Uh, because they don't need to look at the patient, they're not working in any part of the patient that's actually open. And so the idea is instead of having to look up at the big monitor and see, for example, fluoroscopy, they could instead, in a more comfortable way, look ahead of them, and they could also see in stereo these patient-specific body parts, scale them, rotate them, translate them. In the first version of the system we did, you had to, because it was a HoloLens-based system, you did the classic air tap to do this and move things around. And the problem with that is what they're doing is kind of plumbing. They have a catheter in one hand, a wire in the other. They're guiding it through. And for them to go and do something with their hands, they have to let go and go and do it and then get back to doing what they're doing. And so they asked us, could we do something that wouldn't require the use of the hands? And so what you're seeing over here are three images. The ones at the top show the person's head. The ones at the bottom are showing a... Uh, defective heart, uh, which is actually rotating a little bit. You can see the blue part starting to disappear as it rotates basically counterclockwise. Um, now, the views of the head over here, if you look really carefully, you'll notice a little bit more of her hair over here on the right side of her face than over there. That's because she's moving her head just a little bit to the right. And the way this system works is small head motions are used in conjunction with voice to determine what it is you're going to do are used to determine how much what it is that you're going to do gets done, and as well in the case of rotation, the axis of rotation. And so in this case, she's looking a little bit to the right, and when she does that, the axis is going to be, as you look straight ahead initially, is going to be perpendicular to the direction in which she looks, and the deviation of her head motion, it's not really doing eye tracking, but the motion of her head from looking straight ahead is going to determine the speed, this is what we call first order control, of the rotation of the object. Now, depending on which way she looks, it changes the axis. How far away she looks, it changes the speed. Um, we also do this for scale. In this case, for scale, if you look up or to the right, it gets bigger down or to the left, it gets smaller. It's a little safe area in the center, um, which uh, you have to look out of for the actual uh, transformation to occur. And then for translation, kind of coupled with rotation, you can select something by looking at it. And then as you move your head around, you'll see that thing essentially lock to your head until you stop it and leave it in place. And this way, we can pick up a bunch of stuff or the physician can pick up a bunch of stuff before they enter the procedure room, carry it with them, and then let go of it, or look at one of the models they have and basically move it out of the way. So let me show you what this looks like. Um, what I'm going to show you is a, a test run um, in a pilot study uh, for a paper that we published uh, in the ISMAR conference last year that was comparing um, the hands-free approach with the manual approach. And so you'll see basically a trial in, in the study in which you're going to see a destination version of um, this heart uh, rotated and scaled and translated and changed in transparency. And the idea is you, the person, the participant, has to go and match that um, uh, destination. So this is what it looks like. Train. 
Hands the destination free. is on the right over there, so now she's going into hands free mode. She's going to move, it's attached to her head right now. Stop. Rotate. The amount she's deviating determines the speed. Stop. Scale. Stop. Transparent. And it's done over there. OK, so to sum up, um, I've talked about this notion of things needing to get bigger in terms of field of view, faster in terms of lower latency, and the importance in many domains of not using our hands at all, not just bare hands, but no hands interfaces. Um, so at this point, I want to put in a plug for the Mercury Messaging Framework, which underlies a lot of the work that we do. Uh, open source, uh, nice, easy uh, BSD license. You're welcome to download uh, and use it in the work that you do. Um, and then I'd like to acknowledge the many uh, colleagues, students, uh, and funding agencies that were responsible for the work that we did. Thank you. <laughs>